Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through hyperthyroidism. You can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com forward slash hyperthyroidism or in the endocrinology section of the Zero to Finals Medicine book. So let's jump straight in. Let's start with some basic definitions to help you understand some of the components of this topic. Hyperthyroidism, to start with, is where there's overproduction of thyroid hormone by the thyroid gland. Thyrotoxicosis refers to an abnormal and excessive quantity of thyroid hormone in the body. Primary hyperthyroidism is due to thyroid pathology, so it's the thyroid itself that's behaving abnormally and producing too much thyroid hormone. Secondary hyperthyroidism is a condition where the thyroid is producing excessive thyroid hormone as a result of overstimulation by thyroid stimulating hormone. So the pathology is in the hypothalamus or the pituitary producing too much TSH and that's what's causing the high thyroid output. Graves disease is an autoimmune condition where there's TSH receptor antibodies that are causing the hyperthyroidism. And these TSH receptor antibodies are abnormal antibodies that are produced by the immune system and they mimic TSH and stimulate the TSH receptors in the thyroid gland and cause them to secrete thyroid hormone. And this is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. Toxic multinodular goiter, which is also known as plumber's disease, is a condition where there's nodules developing in the thyroid gland and these nodules act independently from the normal feedback system and continuously produce excessive thyroid hormone. Exophthalmus is a term that's used to describe the bulging of the eyeball from the eye socket and this is caused by Graves' disease and is due to inflammation, swelling and hypertrophy of the tissue behind the eyeball that's forcing the eyeball forward. And final definition is pretibial myoxedema. And this is a dermatological condition where there's deposits of mucin under the skin on the anterior aspect of the leg or the pretibial area. And this gives a discolored, waxy, edematous type of appearance to the skin over this area. And it's very specific to Graves' disease. And it's caused by a reaction of the tissues under the skin to the TSH receptor antibodies. So what are the universal features of hyperthyroidism? So the universal features of having a high thyroid hormone level in the body. Anxiety and irritability sweating and heat intolerance, tachycardia or fast heart rate, weight loss, fatigue, even though they have a high thyroid hormone level, they're going to feel exhausted all the time. The thyroid hormone also stimulates the bowel, so you get frequent loose stools, and they can have sexual dysfunction as well. There's a couple of features that are unique to Graves' disease, and these all relate to the presence of TSH receptor antibodies. So you can have a diffuse goiter without any nodules. Thyroid eye disease, which is what we talked about, this exophthalmus. And pretibial myxedema. Some of the features of toxic multinodular goiter. So you'd have a goiter, and then when you palpate it during your thyroid exam, you'd feel firm nodules. Most patients with toxic multinodular goiter are above 50 years old. And just as a reference point, toxic multinodular goiter is the second most common cause of thyrotoxicosis. A solitary toxic thyroid nodule is where there's a single abnormal thyroid nodule that's acting on its own to release thyroid hormone. And these nodules are usually benign adenomas and they're treated quite easily by surgical removal of the nodule, which will stop the excess thyroid hormone from being produced. There's a condition called de Quervain's thyroiditis, and this describes a presentation of a viral infection with fever, neck pain and tenderness, dysphagia, and features of hypothyroidism. And this is where there's a viral infection that's causing a bit of pain and inflammation in the thyroid gland. 
there's a hypothyroid phase, and this is followed by a hypothyroid phase as the TSH levels fall due to negative feedback from the high thyroid gland. And then after the hypothyroid phase, thyroid function tests will return to normal. And this is a self-limiting condition, and all that's really required is some supportive care, usually with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen to help with the pain and the inflammation, and some beta blockers for symptomatic relief of the hypothyroidism if required. Next, let's talk about a concept called thyroid storm. And thyroid storm is a rare presentation of hypothyroidism, and it's also known as thyrotoxic crisis. And this is where there's a more acute, severe presentation of the hypothyroidism, where the patient will get pyrexia, tachycardia, and may have a delirium as well. It requires admission for monitoring, and it's treated pretty much the same way as other presentations of thyrotoxicosis, although they might need more supportive care with fluid resuscitation, antiarrhythmic drugs if they've gone into AF or some other arrhythmia due to the thyrotoxicosis and beta blockers can be helpful to treat the symptoms. Which brings us on to management of the hypothyroidism. So the knowledge that we're talking about here is basically summarised from the NICE clinical knowledge summaries from 2016, and usually treatment of hypothyroidism will be guided by a specialist, as the medication have quite strong potential for side effects. The first line antithyroid drug to treat hypothyroidism is carbimazole and it's usually successful in treating patients with Graves disease and leaves them with normal thyroid function after about four to eight weeks. Once the patient has normal thyroid function they can continue on a maintenance dose of carbimazole and then either this dose is titrated to maintain normal levels and this is known as titration block or the dose is given that's high enough to block all production of thyroid hormone and then the patient has their thyroid hormone replaced with levothyroxine and titrated to symptoms. So this is known as block and replace. Complete remission and the ability to stop the carbimazole is usually achieved after about 18 months of treatment. Second line treatment for hypothyroidism is propothyouracil. And this is used in a very similar way to carbimazole, but there's a small risk of severe hepatic or liver reactions. And these reactions can be severe enough to cause death, which is why carbimazole is the preferred option. Another option is radioactive iodine. And this involves taking a drink that contains a dose of radioactive iodine. This iodine then is taken up by the thyroid gland and the radiation that's emitted into the local area destroys a portion of the thyroid cells. And this reduction in functioning of the thyroid cells decreases the amount of thyroid hormone that's produced, and so you have remission from the hypothyroidism. But remission can take about six months, and the patients can actually be left with hypothyroidism afterwards and require levothyroxine replacement. There's also quite strict rules when somebody takes this radioactive iodine treatment, so they can't be pregnant, and they're not allowed to get pregnant for at least six months after taking the treatment. They should avoid close contact with children and pregnant women for three weeks, depending on the dose, and this is because of the risk to these patients with the radiation. And also, for a few days after the treatment, they need to limit contact with anyone because the dose of radiation that they're emitting is a bit higher during this period. Let's talk about beta blockers for hypothyroidism. Beta blockers don't actually treat the hypothyroidism, but they're used to block the adrenaline-related symptoms in hypothyroidism. These are things like tachycardia, anxiety, sweating, tremor, all of this sort of stuff is improved by blocking that adrenaline drive that you have in hypothyroidism. Propranolol is a good choice because it non-selectively blocks the adrenaline activity as opposed to more selective beta blockers that work only on the heart and they're particularly useful in patients with thyroid storm. Finally, surgery is a definitive option to just remove the whole of the thyroid gland or to remove thyroid nodules. 
This effectively stops the production of thyroid hormone because you don't have the thyroid tissue to produce the thyroid hormone anymore. However, the problem is the patient will be left hypothyroid post-thyroidectomy and require levothyroxine replacement for life to replace that thyroid hormone that they're no longer producing. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.